The Witch Marjorie by Thomas Chalmers Harbaugh. First published in the Occult Digest, Volume 1, Number 3, April 1925. Near the end of what had been a delightful autumn day, a few years before the outbreak of the Civil War, two young men who had a short time before quitted Middletown were ascending the slope of South Mountain. They were well-dressed and as well-mounted, and one would have thought from their chatty conversation that they had long been friends, which was not the case. In fact, they had met for the first time that day and in Frederick. One of the pair was Rawson Wilmot, who lived on the manor beyond the crest of the mountain, and his companion was Eldon George from Philadelphia. The latter had but lately reached Frederick, where at the Park Hotel, he had fallen in with Wilmot, to whom he happened to apply for information concerning a certain part of the Old South. As Wilmot was about to set out for the manor, George concluded to accompany him, and the couple had had a pleasant ride across the country. Wilmot had refrained from questioning his friend concerning his errand to that part of the country, and during the jaunt, George had given out, but little information. At last, however, while they were climbing the winding slope of the famous ridge, the young Philadelphian said jovially, You wouldn't think, Wilmot, that I left Philadelphia with sealed orders? Wilmot returned a look of surprise. It's the last thing I would have thought of, he said. Nevertheless, it's true. I opened the sealed packet as I was commanded to do at Frederick. It was entrusted to my care by my grandfather, General Cephas George, of whom you may have heard, and who now is past 90. Besides the letter of instructions, the packet contained a smaller one, also carefully sealed, which I am to deliver to a resident of the mountain named Marjorie. Wilmot broke the speaker's sentence with a startling exclamation, which seemed to whiten his face. What? Which Marjorie? he exclaimed. I say, George, have you any conception of the character of the person to whose mountain shack you are going? I know nothing about her, and my grandparent, if he knows, prefers to keep his own secrets. Which, you say? Well, the old mountain looks as though it could harbor all the witch hags in creation. Instead of smiling at this observation, Wilmot's face retained its seriousness. I was born in this mountain region, said he, and I don't think I've got a drop of coward blood in my veins, but I'd sooner meet Satan, horns and all, than have a bout with witch Marjorie. Then I'm in for it, I guess, smiled young George. I am my grandparents' only heir, and it would be very unbecoming in me to cut dirt and throw up the job at this stage of the game. But what sort of a bedlam am I about to encounter? A tigress, a rattlesnake, and a witch hag all rolled into one, answered Wilmot. She is the witch queen of South Mountain, and if all reports are true, she can raise the devil and the dead at will. Then I may have an opportunity to witness some of her magic, and the young Philadelphian laughed. Where do I turn off the main road? Right where we are now, and Wilmot reined in his horse. You take that road and follow it to a splintered oak, the lightning's victim, where a mountain way leads upward. By following it, you will soon reach a crazy shack backed by a great rock. That shack is the abode of Witch Marjorie. Well, goodbye. I wish you success, but don't let the old she-cat come any of her hocus-pocus over you. I'll see that she doesn't, responded young George, and after clasping hands in a parting salute, the young men separated. Not a very good certificate of character, thought the young Easterner, as he rode off, the great dun slopes of the mountain at his right. From my friend's description, which Marjorie may have stirred the cauldron in Macbeth, but I'll see for myself pretty soon, and maybe there's a little adventure ahead. The sun had some time before it dropped behind the uneven crest of the ridge, so that the mountain roads were cast in shadows which deepened gloomily as George proceeded. Looking carefully about him as he rode along, he at last found the designated tree and the by-road leading from it up the mountain. At the end of another half hour, he found himself amid the suddenly swooping darkness of the old South Mountain and mechanically drew rein. This is a witch region, sure enough, said he audibly. I'd like to know what business the old general has with the spook hag that he should send me on a mission of this sort. I wonder if he ever knew her. Shaw, General George acquainted with a creature answering to Wilmot's description. It's impossible, but here I am and the mysterious packet is still in my keeping. 
A few rods further on, and Eldon George thought he made out the indistinct outlines of a hut on the mountain. From what he could make out, a huge boulder reared its head above the shack, while in a tree that overtopped the scene, an owl was filling the locality with its dismal hooting. I suppose this is the place, said George, urging his shy animal forward. Now if I could meet this witch hag, I... The owl, with a last discordant hoot, flew flapping through the pines, and the next moment young George recoiled in his saddle. And who are you? screeched a voice from the ground. From what part of the fiery pit have you come with your prying and hardihood? George leaned forward. Surely he had encountered the witch of South Mountain. I have come to see you if you are Marjorie, he said. I'm nobody else, though the mountain scum say I can turn myself into all manner of creatures. You've come to see me, eh? Well, that's clever. Come along, then. Witch Marjorie turned and led the way to the house, at the low-browed door of which Eldon George dismounted. He tethered his horse to a sapling and followed the woman into the house. In a few minutes, a sputtering candle was dissipating some of the gloom of the miserable abode, and George saw before him a woman who might have passed the century mark, a creature bent, wrinkled, and white-headed, but her eyes glittered like sparks thrown from a blacksmith's anvil, and what rendered her home hideous in appearance was the huge black cat that had perched himself on one of her shoulders. So you've come to see me, grinned the hag, as she held the grimy candle close to George's face. You look like, ah, God, I would know his face if I saw it among 10,000. You've got his blood in your veins, I say. You are all spawned alike. Ha, ha, you're all of the same satanic brood. Young George was bewildered by this outburst of rage, and he involuntarily shrank from the devilish face thrust almost against his own. Then he bethought himself of the packet he still carried near his heart. I have been commissioned to deliver this, he said, taking the packet from his bosom. I dare say it will explain itself. Ah, that it will, screamed Witch Marjorie as she snatched the packet from George's hand. And what is it that the devil's brood has sent me? A wedding ring, think you, my precious fool? The young Philadelphian shook his head. Witch Marjorie set the candle down on the leafless table at her side and fingered with the fastenings of the packet. The young man studied her while she worked. Suddenly a cry that seemed to waken the weird echoes of the mountain peeled from the old hag's throat, and she fell back, her weazened face illumined with a flash of rage, as she held up to the wondering eyes of Eldon George a plain gold ring. It's the same, she screeched, as her single auditor shuddered, not at the peal of thunder which at that moment broke over the cabin but at the distorted features revealed by the spooky candle. Seventy-five years ago, he gave me this and then took it away. Just think of it, almost a century waiting for him or for some of his accursed spawn, and you have come. You have his face. Is he still this side of the grave? Does Cephas George still wait for the vengeance of his god? Tell me, where is this man? And he sent the engagement ring back by you, his son. No, I am the grandson of General George. It's just as good, interrupted the mountain witch. All's fish that comes into my net. I knew his blood tide would turn in this direction. I have waited for the hour of retribution. It has come, and you have his face, his demon face, with which I fell in love nearly a hundred years ago. I thank the fates that you have come, you, you a man with his blood in your veins. George would have retreated through the door of the mountain shack if he had not known that it was shut. In another instant, and before he could lift a hand in self-defense, the talon-like fingers of the witch were at his throat, and he was pressed against the wall with her tiger eyes blazing in his face. You have come. Fate has sent you to me at last. And this, this, for the past. And George felt his eyes start from his head as the mountain witch's fingers seemed to meet in his throat. The storm at this moment broke in all its fury about the old hut on the mountain. Great bolts of lightning flared crazily in the sky and the rain pelted down, a veritable deluge to add to the terror of the scene. The next morning, as the sun penetrated the dark crevasses of the old South Mountain, a heap of ruins marked the spot where for years had stood the shack of Witch Marjorie. The mountain streams were still torrents and lightning-riven trees stood or lay everywhere. A horse lay dead in the vicinity of the mountain hut and a hideous-looking cat sat amid the heap of ruins and scowled. 
The storm had tumbled great rocks from the upper slopes of the mountain, and many of these formed a gigantic pile near the cabin. No one ever looked to see what might be under this mountain sepulcher. But one day, a few years later, during the Battle of South Mountain, a Union soldier stooped and picked up a plain gold engagement ring. And while he gazed at the bauble whose date went back almost a century, he could not read the story we have tried to tell, nor imagine the wild ending of two lives in the cabin of witch Marjorie.